nestled below the Sandia Mountains on the outskirts of Albuquerque, New Mexico, is the quiet suburb of Taylor Ranch. Darío and Susan Rodriguez live here with their teenage daughter, Sarah. Really, I think I only have a teaspoon of carrots. While in the ninth grade at the high school, Sarah attended a mandatory five-day-long health course taught by outside contractors. Sarah was surprised by some of what she heard. They told you about gonorrhea, herpes, and the rest of the sexual transmitted diseases, and then said, well, um, condoms don't work, and so you're going to get all of these um, diseases if you do have sex. I didn't understand why people would be telling you these facts, so I told my mom. When I heard that that had happened, uh, that, 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 that this group was, that I didn't even know who they were, so I, I pulled out, there's a bunch of phone books in that closet. I went to get to the phone book, looked up Karen at 9 o'clock at night, called them up, and I said, hello, what kind of, a, what, what is this? You know, what, what kind of organization is it? I had never heard of them before. And she says, oh, we're, we're CareNet. We give help to uh, women or uh, women who have um, problems with pregnancy. And I said, oh, really? What kind of an organization is that? Oh, we're a faith-based organization. And I said, you're in the public schools? She said, yes, we have a contract with the public schools. I said, no kidding. Are you slick? I was, well, the course also included some information about abortion. Um, one of the things I remembered was that at 12 weeks, a fetus was fully developed. It had fingertips and all. That abortion was very scary and was very bad to do because you're killing a live organism. When we got a hold of their curriculum, they actually said 3,000 people were, were, were killed on 9-11 and then compared that to how many babies had been murdered. And that was the first line of their curriculum. The second day, they talked about the bad effects of having sex before marriage. And one was suicide. Premarital sex would give you, uh, might make, um, not might, one of the dangers of suicide, um, psychological effects. You know, abstinence is not a bad idea. We, I think you really need to, to, to um, especially young girls, don't want to be pushed into, into having sex. If, if they have a boyfriend, they, there are all kinds of things that they, you feel pushed and the pressure and all this peer pressure. And that's fine. But I don't like this group coming in and politicizing it. I discovered through my daughter that abstinence only was being taught at her school, and I had no idea what this was. And my daughter came home saying, well, mom, for the past three days, they were talking about, among other things, baby killing. So Susan Rodriguez marched into the Albuquerque school board one night to complain, and she hit a raw nerve. It was one of those things that nobody else wanted to touch, nobody else wanted to get involved in it. Um, you know, they just sort of, okay, you know, fine you know, next, right, that kind of thing. I mean, it is, it's one of those things that's, that are, it's a lightning rod. You know, people just don't want to, don't want to deal with, with these kinds of controversial issues. Abstinence-only education was being taught by one private contractor using federal money in 25 schools in Albuquerque. The issue that's come up is not about abstinence only, it's about particular specific Acosta was upset, not just at the misinformation in the curriculum, but also at the tone of the teaching. I've been an educator for, all my, you know, for about 26 years myself, and I know the impact that we can have on young people as, as educators, and I know the power of, of appropriate engagement in the classroom, um, and of, you know, helping young people develop their own voice and their own identity and their own uh, presence in the world. Shame-based education is not the, the way to go. That's not how you learn. Miguel Acosta's complaints made the front page of the newspaper. More parents got involved, and the controversy spiraled upward. Folks in uh, public health and Department of Health and uh, counselors, uh, social workers in the school, I mean, there was lo lots of folks that were saying we have a problem here. There is a looming public health controversy about whether or not abstinence-only education, as prescribed by the federal government, is meaningful. And in that regard, it became a much bigger policy issue sort of in this department about how do we forge ahead and how do we support the schools to have curriculum that they're willing to have inside the school districts. Secretary Grisham ordered a review of the material 
and found that some of it was inaccurate. As an example, you have two charts in that curriculum. One chart shows you that uh, STD rates are on the rise. The other chart shows you that condom use is on the rise. And so you then conclude that condom use is ineffective because it's led to an increased STD or sexually transmitted disease rate. Well, those two things are not related in that context and it's totally inappropriate to do that. Having warning labels on condoms in your curriculum to suggest that they are unsafe or hazardous to your health, well, that's inappropriate material. What we want is factually based, scientifically sound information. Advocates of abstinence education complained that they never got a fair hearing. Laurel Cordova Edinburgh is one of the authors of the abstinence curriculum used in the Albuquerque Public Schools. Our committee uh, reviewed unanimously, recommended unanimously that this, um, these curriculum. In other words, they met the criteria. There, there was no, there were no statements of fact that were could not be verified by independent sources. Critics add that the state has recommended equally controversial curricula for comprehensive sex education. David Magruder is executive director of Best Choice, the federally funded abstinence education contractor that found itself at the heart of a controversy. We feel it's also equally important that if we're going to be scrutinized and they're going to make claims like that to us that they should also review and scrutinize the comprehensive sex ed programs and make sure that they are likewise medically accurate and appropriate for the young people. The debate, which then raged for several months in Albuquerque in 2005, is typical of what is happening in many communities around the country. It was uh, mostly fear, trying to inspire fear into my daughter so she would not have sex. This is a typical co comment that's made, is that abstinence people are scaremongers. You know, that's all we are, we're just trying to scare kids. No, um, it's just giving them the facts, um, this is what it's like, uh, giving them full information, and uh, then I believe that they, they can make a good choice. The education that we are giving our children with this particular program is not education as we have always known it, in which there is a presentation of alternatives to different kinds of thought. When I started teaching, I received some ridicule. In the past, I'd say four or five years, I have noticed a shift. They're not making fun of it anymore. They're not putting it down. Um, there are some segments. Um, of society that are still very uh, opposed to abstinence education, usually in the medical field. The issue is they went there and hijacked the whole system and told our children that that was the only thing to be abstinent. Some 60 miles south of Albuquerque, another abstinence program has been spreading its message with less controversy. Beth Beers runs the program in Socorro County. Her program was awarded $200,000 in federal abstinence money. <laughs> we believe in uh, abstinence as a holistic approach. So that we believe that um, talking about goal setting, uh, we've, we follow the A through H guideline, federal guidelines, and we believe Goal setting is talking about abstinence. Okay, when we go into the classroom, you don't put up the stand yet because you don't. This is an after school program where kids develop a presentation about sexual abstinence, which they then take to other children in the community. It is a kids to kids approach. Well, you cannot be, you can abstain from just about anything. Mm -hmm. You can abstain. To be effective in the classroom, it couldn't be an adult preaching to <laughs> the kids that it needed to be the kids giving input. <laughs> this is their program, and we're kind, I see my role as a supportive role and an encourager and a cheerleader, and, um, and, and so that's how we started. True, but in this context, we're talking about abstinence until marriage, so abstaining from- Far from being naive, 
Many of these kids have first-hand experience with the social problems that much of Socorro's population faces. My mom had, she got pregnant with me when she was 14 and had me when she was 15. And, I don't know, I was raised by my grandma. And so, like, my relationship with my mom's not really very good. And I kind of raised my little sister starting when I was six because my mom had a lot of drug problems. And we, like, for a while I lived with her in Albuquerque. So I was a six-year-old little girl raising my baby sister with my mom doing drugs and everything. So I have seen everything that can go bad by making bad choices. At 14, I lost my virginity. Uh, our relationship, we had a hard time. We lost the whole commitment and the communication. And now through the education and my job, I've learned. You know, I, I've learned how to communicate and uh, regain all that back, so because of this program that I have chosen abstinence and that I, you know, am how I am and have accomplished what I've accomplished because of goal setting in the fourth grade and all this stuff I've just learned along the way has really changed my life. While the Socorro group promotes this positive message, there is still a lot about sexual education that they leave out of the equation. We don't really talk about condoms. Um, we don't. Um, we just, the, we teach, we focus on abstinence until marriage. We don't promote condom use, but when the discussion of condoms comes up, we do, we do talk about that there are failure rates. We tell kids, if you've taken the risk, get tested. We also put on the blackboard the first name and the telephone numbers for the public health nurse, for our Socorro clinic. I want them to know that, um, should questions come up, that there are trusted adults around that they can also talk to. And then we talk about emotions. We talk about the emotional impact, which a condom really doesn't have anything to do with. And we believe that sex is an emotional act. This is the Nuva Ring. It's a once a month method that women use. It's really fun. Back in Albuquerque, a different group of teenagers has also decided to take matters into its own hands. You're going to be using, you're just really at a higher risk for one of them or both of them to break, to tear, that sort of thing. This group, Young Women United, is run by teenage girls, some of them from Albuquerque's toughest neighborhoods. You know, you know, as is any conversation with your friends about abstaining from sex until marriage? No. 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 Why not? Because, because, well, if you just tell them, like, don't do sex, they're like, well, I don't have to listen to you. And they just don't really care. Because, like, it's a big joke, really. Are, are friends your age having sex? Definitely. I know a bunch of students. Um, from other high schools, uh, as friends, they, um, I, my best friend lost her virginity at age 14, and I was just kind of surprised because she didn't know what happens if she does it. My friend, she truly believed in abstinence. She said she was going to wait until marriage, yet when she went out with her boyfriend, that did not work out. It did not happen. And so, basically, it's just... Was she prepared? No. Okay. The so girls are taking classes from Planned Parenthood to supplement what little information they get at school about sex. I really wanted to know more about sex and how to do um, comprehensives and how to put on a condom and birth control and all this stuff. They don't teach you anything about sex in school. <laughs> they just say don't do it. Yeah, don't yeah. do it. It's bad. They teach us abstinence, and that's basically it. The teachers didn't want to answer any questions that they felt would get them in trouble, sort of. I think the way they felt like if, if the question was too controversial from the student, they just wouldn't answer it. What kind of a question would that be? So, like, which condom is the best? Or, like, they, just, they would just say, don't have sex, or... You don't need condoms because you're not supposed to have sex like that. Teenagers aren't like robots if you tell them 
if you tell them about condom, it's not like they're gonna automatically say, oh, it's okay to have sex now. You, you, we can make our own decisions for ourselves. It's just like the adult's job to give us the information that we need to make our own decisions. What should be in comprehensive sex education? More than one is correct. How to blow a bubble, how to use a condom, how to whistle, or how to use birth control. Just like Beth Beer's abstinence group in Socorro County, these girls are also taking their message directly to their peers. Only it's a different message. I know like a bunch of young adolescents don't receive that much information and they're making mistakes for like false information. So I wanna be the person to spread it, spread the word out to my community. Johnny Wilson of Planned Parenthood says that teaching facts, not values, is what is important. I'm not in a position to tell another person how to act sexually. I'm not in a position to tell a person they need to have one partner for their entire life. That's a value. The absence only people tell us that, oh, it's a mixed message, it's confusing. If we tell them not to have sex and then we give them a condom, it's no, it's not. They get it. Show them some respect. That's another way to get adolescents to look at you and your value system and say, wow, Maybe that's worth it, investing in that. They respect me, I'm gonna respect them. At the local health clinic, Dr. Bruce Trigg says that he's experiencing some fallout from sex education programs which stress condom ineffectiveness. I'm already uh, sensing that some people are um, less likely to, um, to understand how effective condoms are because this message is, is being imposed on huge numbers of people with a lot of federal money behind it that's raising questions about whether condoms work. Basically um, exaggerating the failure rates of condoms and, um, and downplaying how effective they can be to prevent STDs. Most people who come to my clinic with STDs were not using condoms. It, the, re the reason people have STDs is not because condoms failed, it's because they didn't use them. So we're giving kids and adults excuses not to use condoms. It's very clear that condoms are highly effective, and that's the terminology of the Center for Disease Control. They're highly effective if they're used correctly and consistently. Are they 100%? No. Nothing is 100%, right? I mean, some people get killed by their airbags and their cars. Right? But we don't go around disconnecting airbags. In essence, abstinence only is a conservative, religious, and political agenda that's being imposed on America's children with 200 million federal dollars. And this is really, um, you know, sort of government-imposed morality. So this is really a massive sort of social engineering, if you will, right, to change the sexual habits of a very large country that's very diverse. Social engineering or not, it is a fact that teenagers' attitudes towards sex are changing. All I know is, is that there's a shift happening. Some attitudes are starting to change, okay, among youth. In fact, in 2000, the National Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy did a survey of 12 to 17 year olds and they found that about 58% um, of them feel that sexual activity is not appropriate for kids in high school, even if they use um, precautions against pregnancy and STDs. And re their reality is they're not Leading the fight to change attitudes uh, is the Abstinence Clearinghouse a national network for advocates of abstinence education and sexual purity. Its president, Leslie Unruh, insists that teaching should focus on a more positive attitude towards those who abstain, that it's cool to be a virgin. What has happened is moms and dads have gotten involved in their school system and have said, we want to raise the bar. We want our kids that are sitting in that classroom that are not having sex instead of them being made fun of and called geeks. We want them to feel proud about their decision. So we want to put an abstinence program in so we can have positive role models, beauty queens, whoever, to come in to basketball stars, young males, abstinence speakers that stand up and proudly proclaim that they are not only virgins, but they are waiting for one partner, 
one person for a lifetime. Nationwide, teen sexual activity is dropping, and teen pregnancy rates in New Mexico and across the country are also dropping. But surveys show that a majority of young people will be sexually active. It would be an absolute aberration if we were able to even convince a majority of adolescents by, to avoid being sexual even up to the age of 20. Forget until marriage, which it is about 27. I hear that over and over and over. People are going to have sex. In reality, no, in reality, they're not going to have sex. That's what people are missing. Some say there is another problem when accepting abstinence education money. Many of the kids in classrooms who are hearing that the standard for the community is to be abstinent until marriage are, in fact, in have single parents who may or may not be having boyfriends and girlfriends. Some students are in gay and lesbian families. The, the, the curricula completely excludes any mention of homosexuality. They don't need to be further stigmatized, and that's exactly what this does. What do you do when kids in New Mexico, half of them are in a single parent household? What are you teaching kids about sexual activity and its relationship to marriage or not being married? And then that, that, that uh, for this department then became, what does that say about sound public health policy? In Washington, D.C., the abstinence clearing house began working behind the scenes to counter any major decision the state of New Mexico might make against abstinence education. Most of what we're doing in New Mexico would be covert. And that's the way the abstinence community has had to go in the state. It's kind of like with, um, with the CIA. They're not going to tell you everything they're doing. Well, the abstinence community has its own war room and its own CIA, and Mexico is one of those places that we do um, have some things going on covertly. Leslie Unra says she will bypass any decision made by the state of New Mexico and establish abstinence programs on sovereign Indian reservations. We're excited. It's, it's a great place, and um, we've done the needs assessment, and we are really excited with the pilots that we've seen come back. Very excited. We have found multiple cases around the country where no one's watching what's going on. What's happening in New Mexico worries Bill Smith, who tracks how federal abstinence money is being spent. He says the country needs more people like Susan Rodriguez. And it was her actions that, draw the, that drew the political attention and the oversight of some state-based agencies to say, why is the federal government here in our state funding an individual private grantee to undermine our own efforts around teen pregnancy prevention, around STDs, and around HIV? Um, it's really a fundamental violation of, of taxpayers' rights in their states and communities that the federal government's funding stuff that undermines efforts that, that the state would not otherwise support. Secretary Grisham wrestled with the issue for several months. Then, in consultation with the Department of Education, she announced a dramatic change. We requested that we could take the abstinence-only education money for New Mexico, which is about half a million dollars, and direct it to sixth grade and under. And in fact, more recently, we've clarified that it could be um, third graders. I mean, we really want to emphasize sixth and under. And the decision by the federal government has been, yes, the state has the right to do that, and they approved that request. The decision was upsetting to advocates of abstinence education at both the local and national level. We've been successful in the classroom and we're going to continue with that, even with this change in, in policy. So we're not going to let it deter us in any way, shape or form. Well, most children in sixth grade and below, depending on the child and his family structure, still in latency. Uh, we have um, studies that show the innocence and the brain research now that's there, that you are not to awaken within that child at, before it's time these types of issues. We are not getting ahead of this problem. We have the third highest pregnancy rate in the nation. 
The only way to stop the trend is to get at it early. And in a state like New Mexico, we've got a high, high, high concentration of minority girls who find themselves pregnant and in large Hispanic families. Then I've got the third grade young girl who already has seen that sexual behavior in pregnancy is the norm in their family at sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. I've got to get to that young person early. As school opened in September, no more abstinence-only education was being taught here at the high school or in the middle schools. It had taken the better part of a year, but the fight had been worth it to the Rodriguez family. We have to be extremely careful with our own educational system. I am a strong believer that a society has to take care of its member. A society has to care for its members. And one of the caring of the society is to educate their children in the correct way. An education cannot be complete if it's always one-sided. And this is one of the issues that I think is extremely important for the rest of the, not only parents, but in general for the, for, for the citizens of the country to be aware of, not let themselves be hijacked by a particular ideology, not let them hijack our school system by a particular ideology that says that sex education consists exclusively of no sex.